We have so much power, we've even taken not only to alter the landscapes, we have come to alter the way elements flow in this world. We've altered the natural cycle of carbon, of phosphorus, of nitrogen. And this has allowed us, in the Western world especially, to enjoy an extraordinary level of material comfort, of material luxury. And when you think about all this power, there's a mounting evidence that we might be using our power in a way that could harm us. That we have only one planet and we might be soiling our nest. And so, in response to this fear, there's been a new branch in science that has looked just at the connection between technology and the environment. That has asked the basic question, how can we live within our means? And well, at the core of this is some kind of compromise. We want to keep on altering the world for our benefit, don't we? We want to keep on reshaping the world with technology and its power. But we don't want to alter the world too much. We don't want to, to scrap our environment. And really what this is about is about trying to balance two very complicated systems, the environmental system and the technological system. All right, well, how do we start balancing this? What do we mean by too much damage to the environment? How much is too much? There's the rub. And well, you can't just add it up, right? There's different kinds. There's global warming, the chief enemy right now. There's acid rain, there's the ozone hole. There's toxic releases, nuclear waste, noise pollution, habitat destruction, loss of biodiversity, eutrophication. Eutrophication is something we should all know about. This is when too much fertilizer reaches a, a water ecosystem and things start to choke up because there's too much food. Reminds you of a society here or something? Yeah, yeah eutrophication of Western society, yes. Ah, well, all right, enough of the editorial. Uh, there are other problems that we need to take into account also. Problems more on the long term. Nuclear waste, that lasts a long time. And also fossil fuels. Well, they have lasted a long time. We see how long now. Well, and, okay, technology, as we saw, is very powerful. We can use our power for good. We can try to introduce a new technology that would diminish our impact on global warming. But very rarely will you find a technology that will reduce all impacts simultaneously. Typically, you will reduce one impact at the cost of another. You will introduce, for example, a special kind of biofuel that will help you with global warming, but that will require a large expanse of land for cultivating it. And as the land is becoming more scarce and there's more people, eventually some Amazon forest might end up getting cut. So this is what we call problem shifting. Now how, okay, let, let's not give up. How do we go about handling things? handling this, managing this. Well, what the scientific community has done is to try to regroup these impacts into what we call areas of protection. So one thing that we all want to protect that is very important for the people in this room is human health. And then we can regroup everything that impacts human health. How does global warming impact human health? For, exam for example, in changing the way that uh, malaria is spread across the world as the climate changes. How does air pollution affect human health? What is the carcinogenous power of some of these toxic releases that we have? So that's one thing we'd like to protect is we'd like to stay healthy, everybody. Then there's the more classical definition of our environment. We want to preserve ecosystems. We want to preserve especially their diversity. And we start asking, well, how does global warming affect 
ecosystem diversity? How does toxic releases affect ecosystem diversity? And a third area of protection, and a final one, is access to resources. We have access to a lot of resources now. Do we want them to still be there for future generations? Or if I have a cotton production that uses all the locally available water, this is not a one generation versus another, it's me versus everybody else. And so this is already a more manageable set of trade-offs, right? We have three things that we try to balance as we move along in the technology. Now, of course, you may ask, well, three. When I choose what to buy, I have a single price. Could I have also a single environmental indi in indicator? It's really a question of values. Do you value hu humans more than a national park? How many human lives is a national park worth? Do you value the present generation more than the next one? By how much? How much petroleum should we leave for the next one? This kind of consideration. So as there are no simple answers, in addition to this problem, there's the elephant in the room, which is that there are huge uncertainties surrounding what are the effects of our, our technology on human health and ecosystems and resources. We're very much playing Sorcerer's Apprentice, really. And so it is very much not only about balancing our options, but about risk assessment. All right, the picture is pretty grim. Well, not, this is not the only thing that industrial ecology or that science does is to say that things are grim. We, we, we also try to look on the other side, at the technology. How can we make our technology better? Well, all right, let's try. Technology seems to be a bit complex, right? What is technology? It's in everything we do. It's everywhere. So again, we need to try to simplify this problem to, to, to solve it. Well, one approach is to say that all technologies require material. And that matter is never created, nor is it destroyed. And so as some material enters our economy, our enters our technological sphere, where does it flow? Where does it go? Where does it accumulate? And then when do we just return it to the environment? So this is called material flow analysis. And just to give you a quick example without getting too much into the details, this is the best picture we have uh, of how nickel flows in our economy. It enters from the mine, it is refined, and we see from the very closed loop uh, around fabrication and manufacturing that there is actually a very high level of recycling of nickel by the industries. But when it's our turn as consumers, and when we discard our goods that contain nickel, only 50% roughly of this nickel ends up getting recycled. And so obviously MFA or material flow analysis has quite a bit of potential in helping us close the loop, helping us dematerialize our economy, helping us not always needing new inputs of resources, but recycling more efficiently materials. And of course, this is of great interest to policymakers, it can be of great interest also to some key industries like the steel industry or the aluminum industry. That's one approach we can have about technology. But we can also simplify technology in some other way. We can say that technology is a set of products. And then we can ask, well, what is the impact of each product? And this is called life cycle assessment. Why is it called that? Because you can't just look at the product and ask, well, how much is it polluting right now? My battery is not emitting anything. But of course, my battery has a function, has a past, and has a future. So we look at its whole life cycle. My battery stores electricity and then re-delivers it to my computer. 
and waste some of it as heat. It also had to be produced and eventually will have to be disposed of and recycled or retreated. The electricity that it wastes as heat also had to be produced. So there's a power plant appearing at the top. And so how efficient my battery is quite, quite a bit matters. And also my battery had to be produced from components, which in turn had to be produced from materials, which in turn had to be extracted and refined. And all these activities have emissions and impacts. And then I can start to have a decent picture of what's the consequence of me owning this battery. And I can also start comparing it with this other battery. Our research group is in active dialogue with a battery company. And they're very interested in knowing, well, if we really want to be environmentally friendly, what is the component that's at fault? What should be changed? And so you have to try to track down in the value chain, where is the impact from? Now, when I said that life cycle assessment was a simplification, it is. At some point, you have to stop. Because every process requires, uh, well, requires energy, certainly, requires transportation. Every single of these activities requires a factory plant, an engineer. Every engineer needs a computer. Every computer needs a battery. And eventually, everything in the economy is interconnected. And so you have a huge mess again. This is OK, because there's another tool that we have developed to pick up the slack. LCA tracks every product. But we can just zoom out with what we call input-output analysis. This is about taking the economy, let's take the US economy, and let's divide it into 400 industries and look at what industry is buying from what and what industry is emitting what. So there's a very nice visualization on the web that uh, I encourage all of you to go and try called economymap.net, which allows you to see where the emissions are from and where they are in, the, in an economy. And it is based on a US economy, a US input-output table compiled by uh, Sai Wansu based on governmental surveys. So here is, for example, eutrophication that I defined earlier, the choking of ecosystems. And you can see that there's too much fertilizer reaching the water because of the cotton production, the grain production, other crops, and also electricity because of the combustion. Now, these are the polluting industries, but they pollute because other industries need their products, right? So maybe they should be blamed. And you look that, well, the grain is grown mostly to feed animals for meat, and also for prepared food, and the cotton is grown for textile. And we still have the electricity here. That is quite important. But all these intermediate industries, they also exist because, for a reason, they exist because you and me buy their products. So let's look at what household consumptions indirectly cause all the eutrophication in the US. Well, you see that people buy a lot of clothing, certainly buy a lot of meat, use quite a bit of electricity in their households, and eat a lot in restaurants and bars. And this is pretty much what is driving the eutrophication in the US, in a nutshell. Now, of course, as we talked, this is only one impact. There's, of course, global warming, other industries. Each industry is a separate dot, so you have 400 dots there, whole US economy. You have human toxicity, and so on and so forth. Now, what is this all good for? Life cycle assessment, the tracking of products, is very interesting for product designers. It's very interesting for comparing specific options. Input-output analysis is interesting partly because it is a good complement for LCA and partly because it can help stir a whole economy, can give a general diagnosis. 
what is there in it for us as citizens and consumers? As you saw, our, our impact on the environment is extraordinarily complex. Our technologies are extraordinarily complex. So it's not surprising that there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of debate uh, within the scientific community. So today, what do we do? It can become very disheartening. It can become very frustrating. You're told one thing, you're told the other. A personal story, it, it used to take me hours to do the groceries. I'd stand in an aisle somewhere and there would be canned chickpeas and dried chickpeas. Oh, the can, that was bad. It was so much packaging, metal packaging, and it was heavier for transport. But they recycle these cans rather well, all in all. And the energy efficiency of the cooking in the industry, that's probably better than the, efficient, the energy efficiency that I can do in my apartment when I cook those chickpeas, right? And then there's imported chickpeas and there's organic chickpeas that came from further away and start to do the LCA in my head and just start to despair. And eventually I just go home without chickpeas there. <laughs> so, so that is not the most constructive approach. Luckily for us, there are some basic rules that we don't like to hear about because they're not always pleasant, but overall they work. And all this focus on details is very often just a distraction because we don't want to remember the general rule. If you reduce your consumption, if you reuse what you have, and if you recycle anything that you have to throw away, in the vast majority of cases, that's enough to get started. Now, okay, speaking in general, the three R's. What can we reduce? Our homes could be a lot better protected from the cold or the heat so that we waste, don't waste so much electricity. Eating meat is one of the most environmentally intensive decisions that one can make. All the corn and all the grain that goes into feeding the animal could go straight to feeding humans. And so by cutting the middleman, or the, the middle animal, you, you, you save on pretty much every single impact that is associated with agriculture. So to go back to my chickpeas, I should have bought whatever chickpea was convenient for me that day and felt good about it, <laughs> that I was having a vegetarian meal that day. Now what else can we reduce our consumption of? Well, there's the eternal car. And this is a very, there's a feel good message in there. Think of all the research that goes into making a car 10% more efficient. You and me, we can all make our cars double, we can double the efficiency tomorrow. You talk to your coworkers, you carpool, you have two people in the car instead of one, you just double the efficiency of your car. How we use our technology eventually is what is important. It's not about being optimistic or pessimistic about technology. It's about using it right, using our power right. Ultimately, living within our means is about being more careful about how we treat the environment, making the technology better, Making technology work for us on the long run. Making technology work for us and not the other way around. Thank you very much.